And the very last lecture that we did, did I think it was only just three weeks ago, was a lecture on security. Right? And um, security talks about the future. We actually talked about three key emotions, fear, anxiety, and dread. Multiple parts of the world today itself are moving into the future right, with that kind of anxiety. We suggested that there was another way of handling the future, right? and this is what we call the promise. The case of a terrorist attack in Singapore is not a question of if anymore, it's a question of when. And we can be filled with anxiety over here and says, oh no, we must somehow stop it. You can't. You can't stop it. But what you can do right, is that you can I think, offer a promise. A promise that most of France is now responding to and saying that despite a terrorist attack, we will stay together no matter what. Right? These are the promises over here that take us essentially into the future. And it's also by design why we're using this to enter into politics and governance. Because politics and governance is nothing more than a promise. In his lecture, Ho Kwon Ping actually raised up right, three main ideas okay, in his lecture that talked about where he really felt right, the political challenges of Singapore were right, within the next 50 years or so. The first idea he talked about was this idea that generally, and we have heard this earlier before, that Singapore is no longer galvanized. In the early years of Singapore's growth, it was absolutely necessary for us to galvanize Singaporeans. The key thing itself right, that made Singaporeans largely rally together, drop racial differences, drop religious differences, was poverty. The affluence that Singapore has experienced over the years has largely taken away that particular threat, which means now we no longer have anything that really pulls us together. Okay? But at the same time itself, right, we also have become far more educated, right, which means propaganda no longer works on us. If there's no common threat and there's no common narrative, what truly pulls the cosmopolitan city together? The day that Singapore comes to a day right, where we are no longer united as a nation, right, you can more or less see that the wealth will disappear within two generations. You must understand right, that everything that has made Singapore tick or what's making it successful essentially itself right, is the fact that we stick together, that we, unlike other countries, we are exceptional. We truly do not break so far on racial and religious lines. Hong Kong Ping was saying that if there's going to be one political threat, is that there's no longer a unifying political narrative. The Kuan Yew story was, third world to first, third world to first, we're going to make it. Right? But now that we're in a first world state, right, the next question to ask over here is, then what of the next 50 years? What is the aspirational story that will get us somehow to begin to work together right, and create some sort of common goal? Right now, you guys are roughly anywhere between 18 to 28. If you're older than that, you're not supposed to be in this lecture. <laughs> This demographic is essentially the demographic or the age group right, that actually took Singapore from third world to first in 1965. In 1965, our pioneer generation was largely 18 years old, 20 years old. This is currently the generation where Hong Kong Ping was now saying, then therefore this is now your responsibility. So if, let's say you're now sitting here in this room and you're going, I'm now 22 years old and I'm expected itself right, to be responsible for Singapore's flourishing in the next 50 years, right? And then you're thinking, I have no idea, right? Are you, I expect me to start doing this? And let's say it sounds like you are clueless. Then the good news is, in 65, they were clueless too. No one had any idea how to do this, right? The difference is, is that in 65, they were clueless, but they were hungry. By 2015, we are clueless and we are full. And that poses the second challenge. We've basically got right, an entire generation of people that are expected to keep this nation right, flourishing and alive. And in doing so over here, there isn't a motivation to have them begin to imagine and see. The third, there has been no democratically elected government okay, that has lasted more than 50 to 75 years. There have been monarchies that have stayed around right, for more than 50 years, but there hasn't been a democratically elected government. Sooner or later, the party becomes irrelevant. So when one and two begin to fall in, then three also basically naturally follows. Right. What is causing the anxiety or the fear about Singapore politics in the next 50 years? Is this man here. By next term, we will meet this man. Right. And notice this guy that in this room, no one knows who he is. No one. Internationally, he may be unknown. He may have barely had four years uh, to even start to break ground internationally. Domestically, he will step into an environment where the entire demographic is diverse as diverse can be. 
right? And he himself will have no real name. So the question we want to answer right, in today's lecture right, is really, can we lead without a name? If this person itself right, has no real name, will Singapore remain politically successful, vibrant, right? and largely itself, right, we won't descend into US politics. Everyone kept talking about basically this man, Lee Kuan Yew. And one thing itself, right, that one of the ministers made as a comment, which struck me very deeply, right, was that he said, men like this, right, they don't come along e easily. Right? Maybe if a country is really lucky, every 100, 200 years, you will find one. Right? And I asked, right, from your experience over here, what really made him so different? Right? And what he was saying over here is basically three key words. There are very few politicians right, that are able to play all three roles. The bureaucrat is the one that takes right, a lot of policy work, right, a lot of visionary work, and puts it into actual practice, right, and puts it into the civil service. The politician is the one that knows right, domestically who the people are. He is on the ground, knows the people, and therefore has the influence right, to lead the way he does. The statesman is the one that represents the states, the state on the international level, and he's also able right, to conduct right, or manage that particular state all right, with other international leaders. In doing so over here, typically, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you will have a national leader that is able to embody two out of three. Most of the time, you will get a national leader that embodies one out of three. Most of the time. Right? You will get a national leader that's elected either as an excellent bureaucrat, which we have in many of the ministers, Right? Not particularly charismatic, but an excellent bureaucrat can get things done. Right? And Singapore chooses that first, right, among all other things over there. If you look through right, our own cabinet, think through how many of them itself, right, really embody all three. And how many of them genuinely embody only one. Right? Lee Kuan Yew embodied all three. When he did this over here, Right. He began, therefore, as an individual, as a personality, to define very, very deeply right, the kind of nature of Singapore politics. Right. And the first thing itself right, that came about was this particular idea between substance and charisma. Given the context of today, should the PAP invest in charisma? When I've actually had the opportunity to speak face to face with ministers, right, I again ask the question, so why do you keep asking these questions? Right. Whether or not right, there should be charisma or competence. Right, there. And his response was this is actually quite clear-cut. Um, your answer will immediately reveal for me whether you have an ego or no ego. Right. And what we're terrified of right, in Parliament are egos. Because once the ego steps in, right, it becomes about me, and it doesn't become about the state. And if you're expected right, to lead a country as complex as this, you better not have an ego because you're not going to be popular for very soon. Right. A lot of the times over here, people right, who are actually hungry right, or have charisma, typically they do enjoy the response. Right. But what makes Singapore tick is always substance, delivery. So Lee Kuan Yew was charismatic, but at the heart of it, right, he believed that anybody I bring on my team, I don't care itself whether you have charisma. I care whether or not you're able to do. And that's why he is the statesman that he is. Many international leaders right, are elected based on charisma. Right? And in doing so over here, they have a lot of difficulty when it comes down to actually moving with the civil service or moving basically right, with their congress to actually get things done. Right? And in doing so over here, right, they have a lot of respect right, for any one given political leader that can look at a country or a city and actually literally is able to deliver stuff. Not just deliver on results, but able to deliver on results to a third world to first in 40 years. Right? And that is an exceptional achievement. And this is largely right, what was giving Lee Kuan Yew the international influence that he had. Let's say you're in a scenario, and I'll ask you to make a choice right, between complete anarchy, anarchy, no order whatsoever, complete anarchy, and tyranny. Who would choose chaos? You prefer chaos. Who prefer the tyrant? If you look at this result you see over here, what's interesting about it is that roughly we're at 70-30. 30 would prefer chaos. The belief is generally, I can survive in chaos. I still have choice, and I'm rough, I'm tough, I can survive this. 
right? A lot of people are right? Seventy percent believe I'm not going to survive this, right? And in that sense, over here, when they step out, they think I'd rather be under the tyrant because the tyrant represents at least some semblance of order, right? There. What Lee Kuan Yew brought, right, as a bureaucrat, is essentially order. Right? Whether it's about law, whether it's about whatever the case over there, but what he essentially brought was order. And that right, satisfied the majority of people almost all the time. And the last, the politician. One of the biggest things I've struggled with right, as a growing leader, not managers, no, leadership, the people itself right, who are literally bringing systemic change to something, right, who are looking at this and calling out what everyone else doesn't dare call out. And you call that out, I guarantee you, you will be seen. The greatest fear self that I had was that people would see me. It's one of the deepest fears of mine, right? That if I'm seen, my family will also be seen, right? And I'm seen over here, I'll be seen for everything, judged for everything. Lee Kuan Yew, whether or not, right, he was ready, he was seen anyway. We have never, right, in our life, seen basically a minister who came from Cambridge uh, had the ability to go down to the streets over here and literally talk gangster talk, sweep the streets and do this and still laugh and go back and suddenly become a statesman again. The ability itself, right, of that fluidity of leadership, right, was amazing. And in being able itself, right, to do that, right, he was necessarily seen from all walks of life and his family was seen at the same time. And it was necessarily itself, right, a demand that he was making of all his leaders you are going to be seen. When I step up as a leader, right, you will see everything. And I am ready for you to see everything because when you're able to see everything, my capacity to be corrupt with you is slim. Competence, clarity of order, which means right, the systemic thinking is super strong, but at the same time itself, right, a ability to have the courage to say, you are able to see me. There are very few leaders with all three characteristics at the same time. What I just explained to you right, about who Lee Kuan Yew is, is what the name means. So the question to ask is, what is a name? Let's start to start right, with a very simple monotheistic religious context, right? because we can use this as a myth or a metaphor to understand the idea of what the name is. Whether or not the Quran, the Torah, or the Bible talk about it over here, all three major orthodox religions, right, on that level, talk about, right, this is what we call the naming of animals. That Adam, as the first man, was given basically, right, the privilege or the right to name each of the animals. So, if I go over to you and I say, you are cow, and you are dog, and you are what it is, Right, you have over there. And each time itself, right, the naming is given, right? The naming also comes with a story. Coffee. Woman. Money. And each time itself, right, I give a name. I'm not just naming. I'm writing a story. When I say cow, I just don't mean C-O-W, that's the name. I'm saying around you, there's a story of who you are, what you will be, what you will do, what I will do with you, what you can do to me. So when you name, right, and what's in a name is not literally, right, I'm not even joking about this, huh? it is not simply a name. It is literally, and it can be, a destiny. A lot of the stories around your own names, right, your surnames, your actual first names, right, there are stories around them, and they do shape you. But names go into all manner of politics. This is very simple school politics. Right? She's the babe, he's the nerd, he's the wimp. But bullying right, is essentially around that whole territory of the name. Bullying doesn't start with this. Bullying starts with the naming first. I don't come over and step on you because I have to name you first before you know who you are. A lot of the power of the naming right, is really essential because we have to necessarily give names in order to cause action. So, President Habibi called this the little red dot. And the attempt itself of the name is actually to say that because you are, you are this, that's why I get to step on you, little red dot. And the funny thing about all kinds of responses to names is that you don't have to take it. 
if the name is given to you, you can reject the name. And I'm saying over here, right, you may call me this name, but what this means to us and what this means to you are very, very different things. And you do not get to politicize me this way. You see, that essentially itself, right, is what the call of leadership and what it does. Because everyone else was calling us names. But leadership is when they're saying, right, I don't care about the name you're calling me. I will call myself something else. So we internationalized, right, the little red dot. You can see it. How do we recontextualize this name? How do we take this name and turn it around right, and find all the other applications of it? Let's think about the throne. What's really interesting about that is that the throne or any place of leadership only really has value right, because the kingdom has value. I am the CEO of Go Ting Kwak Electrical Private Limited right, and the CEO of Microsoft. And both have a throne, but the throne only has value dependent upon the value of the kingdom. If the kingdom has no value, the throne is pointless. Our discussion right, on leadership and about the throne is not a discussion about the throne. Our discussion about the throne is really a discussion about the kingdom. The fascinating thing is that Singapore as a kingdom is built only on name. Singapore has no natural resources. It has nothing to speak for it other than its name. The reason why people trade here, live here, want to migrate here, the reason why people fight for it or love it is because of what we have achieved in name. In name, what else do we truly offer besides our name? We have a reputation for incorruptibility. We have a reputation for modernity. We have a reputation right, for reliability. All those things are not wood oil, water. The value of Singapore's throne is dependent upon basically the reputation of this kingdom because the kingdom right, relies on nothing else besides that. And if you start thinking this through, then who is responsible for the reputation of a kingdom? It's the same question as who is responsible for the reputation of your family. It's not your father or your dad is each one of us. It really is each one of us. Singapore, therefore, stands for a few key things. Right? Its progress, its reliability, its incorruptibility, all these particular things right, are actually reputation-based ideas. Whether you're from government, corporation, religious organisation, charity organisation, it doesn't matter. Right? We come down damn hard on corruption. But why do we do so? If you have corruption in Singapore, you lose your main competitive advantage. Singapore is one of the most costliest countries in the world, and the reason why right, top nationals come over here and invest in this country is because we are non-corrupted. We don't have to deal with a little bribery here, bribery there, and all the uncertainty of whether someone's going to be delivered. We just promise, yes, it will be delivered, and we deliver. Right? No questions asked. We will charge a premium for that. It's a bit more expensive, but you can guarantee that largely itself right, we are incorrupt. A small state which is functional, reliable, incorrupt, it is more powerful than a state itself, right, which is many times larger, but dysfunctional. That system itself right, is largely the golden goose. The golden goose will keep laying golden eggs again and again and again and again as long as we stay incorrupt. Once a leader comes in right, and actually starts to damage that corruption, you slay the golden goose. And when wealth disappears, your social cohesion will also start to slowly disappear. Singapore is no more ethical, no more harmonious, no more cohesive itself than any other people in the whole world. The key reason itself right, why we don't fight is because we all have a piece of the pie. But the day itself right, that 5 million people have to start contending for one piece of pie, I guarantee you, you will crack like any other country itself on racial and religious lines. If Singapore basically right, has a terrorist attack coming to us right, and it attacks us, the truth of it is that we probably will recover from it because our reputation is undamaged. It would be deeply painful for us as a society, but generally speaking, that isn't the most devastating attack. The most devastating attack right, that we could really, at the core of what's making this country run, right, is to attack right, our name.
and you really understand foreign press, right, then the stories that they run out in discrediting this name is crucial for their competitive existence. They have to call us names. Right? And that's why Ministry of Foreign Affairs is a very brutal place to work in. Because they will fight this name calling all the time and you do not get to call us this. So ask yourself a question. Right? If you lose your name, right, whose fault is it? The bully or you? The Jews understood this right, beautifully during the Holocaust. During the Holocaust, right, Nazis were essentially trying to call Jews another name. Worthless, valueless life. And because you are what you are, then I will do that to you. But the funny thing about this over here is that the Jews uh, remain deeply resilient in terms of who is it they are. That you can call me many things, but I know who I am. No one can make an attack upon Singapore and attack our name other than ourselves. If there is a fear right, among basically leaders within Singapore, the key fear is this, that no one really understands right, the idea that we learned in primary two that Singapore has no natural resources and the only thing guaranteeing the success of this kingdom is reputation. Attack our leaders, attack our policies, but don't attack the kingdom. There will always come a day within a person's life where a critical juncture, it could be an event, it could be a trial which you're going through, where you start to believe in your name. That day uh, comes at different junctures for different people. Right? For some people in this room, it hasn't happened to you yet. You've yet to find a purpose or a direction, or your name has yet to actually really hold meaning. At what point in time in Singapore's history did we start believing in our own name? It didn't happen in 65. Singapore didn't mean what it means now. And if there's a single greatest gift right, that the early pioneers right, gave to us, was that they gave us the ability to believe in our own name. To say Singapore, have a passport and actually hold pride in it. Those emotions, are, they don't come cheaply, you know. We believe in our name, right? We believe in what is possible. We believe in what's next. If I basically, right, today tell you that, you know, Singapore's going to do this, or Singapore's going to do that, or Singapore's now going to establish this particular, you know, new project, do you get it? Very few people are going to disbelieve that. Cambodia, Myanmar, Russia, United States of America, and they made a declaration and they'll say, this is what's next. And I can tell you the people in the US itself will still go, are you for real? Because I no longer believe in the name. Do we get that the United States of America no longer means what it did 50 years ago? Can names go up and down? Of course they can. They can hold vastly different meaning. And no one can take away the value of a name other than ourselves. Some years back, right, Lee Kuan Yew sat here. And as he sat here, right, he began to declare certain things about Singapore. That Singapore will be this, Singapore you know, will be what we are now seeing now today. I was asking the, the team when they first set up whether or not we should put a flower or uh, some memento and put it on that particular chair. Right? Whether we should put something just to make sure that no one sits. The back of my mind, right, I was just thinking, is anybody going to sit there? So for those of you at the back over here, you don't know this, but this empty chair you see here, it actually has an inscription that says, Lee Kuan Yew, Prime Minister. And nobody in this room is taking the chair. And we don't sit in that chair for a reason. We don't sit in the chair because of the certain respect and reverence that this chair should be out of empty. Lee you didn't get us to believe in him. Lee Kuan Yew got him, got us to believe in ourselves. And that's why it sounds like his passing, right, you still have a resilient state. Lee Kuan Yew said, don't believe in me. 
I'm on an interim. My name is helpful, I will use it as an instrument, but largely itself, right, I'm not the point. Learn to believe in yourselves, because that will be what will keep yourself going. But the extent of believing in yourself is not to believe in yourself, like, oh, myself, but rather that we believe in ourselves as instruments to a much more larger vision. Getting like 4 billion people to operate like this, it's tough. It really is tough. To have a see beyond cells. Because in this picture, you always see in all the books and things like that, underneath that, uh, right, uh, millions and millions of strong families, good relationships, powerful conversations, right, meaningful focus upon work. Right? Multiple people inside, who are other organizations you're coming from. Politically, unlike economics, unlike security, right, unlike even family, they are all subject to external threats. Politically, leadership questions, right? They are more susceptible to internal threats when we self-radicalize. In Singapore's context, right, it's not a terrorist you're afraid of. It really isn't. It's our own egos. Singaporeans, for some reason, right, are deathly scared to be seen. If youth are going to lead the next future, right, there's going to be a need for courage. The greatest fear itself of standing in a public space and standing in front of all these people is basically what are people going to see? Right? And the greatest test of this is if I take any of you, just take you out right here and stand down here, the stories that come to your head immediately will give you feedback as to what you don't want people to see. It will tell you what your resistances are, right? It will tell you what your greatest fears are, it will tell you what you're hiding. But those particular things, right, if you take a good look at them over there, also, what if you get past will bring immense innovation into your life. New results, new territories, new places for you to go into. Right? But you only know that if you're willing to be seen. This place they were in um, had multiple really good men who were willing to be brave. They came, they made rigorous debate, they showed up, they showed themselves. And do they know what they were doing? They didn't. But the value itself of holding a lecture like this in this particular space, right, is largely that. Right? Yeah. That there's a precedence and a culture that we can learn from. That people learn to be brave. And because they were, that's why you get to live in the city that you live. This is one of my deepest visions for young people in Singapore. Yeah. Um, learn to be brave. So I started this lecture by asking you whether or not we can lead without name. And I'm suggesting, I'm hoping, that this question means very different things now. The name we're looking for is not some big man or some leader itself that will come over and save the day. The name we're looking for is the call of our reputation of who is it we are. And the answer to that is that, no, you cannot live without name. So the good news is that all of us contribute to this name. So I don't think that the, in the politics and governance of Singapore, this is the job of a cabinet. This is the job of a citizen. Okay, thank you. I'll take questions.